Thank you. Um, so I'm assuming that my screen is showing uh, the actual screen and not some weird back thing. Um, so it's not, tell me. Um, so I, yeah, look, thanks for that. I'm going to talk a little bit about data fluency uh, today, but um, with a particular emphasis, I guess, on um, how it's impacted on, on a part of our workforce. We, um, the data fluency program uh, is designed to teach digital skills across the university. Um, and as you all have seen from some other uh, presentations, uh, also uh, Monash's partners and people who work with outside the university as well. Um, but uh, we, um, as a way of, of, uh, of being able to support that, we use a combination of volunteers um, and uh, graduate students who um, work, who are stu students within the university. Um, and that's been a really interesting uh, model for us. Uh, we, you know, when we started this, we thought we'd be able to do it with, with, all with volunteers. And that was certainly the original basis uh, that we did it on. Um, but we found that if we wanted to scale it to the level that we wanted to scale it to, um, that we needed uh, a pool of people who could help uh, build our community and uh, do some other things. So that's a sort of a bit of a, a, a background to what we do, there we go. Um, so we have, we, you know, like everybody, we, we have a community of practice and that's one of the things that we are uh, working on and developing uh, across the program. In our case, um, our community practice consists of a bunch of different things. We have uh, workshops in uh, research skills um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute. Um, we have uh, monthly seminars uh, and networking and they were originally face-to-face um, uh, -face sessions that we would have once a month. Um, we've now moved those online, which has been interesting. We've lost a bit of the networking, but we've gained an audience. Uh, when we had it in a, you know, in a room somewhere at the university, we got a reasonable turnout every month, but you know, we've, we've now had seminars uh, where you know, we've had 100, 150, 200 people turn up, uh, which has been you know, fantastic. Um, and that's the, you know, one of the, the upsides of being stuck, stuck in COVID. Um, we have a, 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 a weekly drop-in that we usually uh, coincide with the seminar. So we have the seminar and then continue the drop-in. Um, again, I'll show you some of the numbers on that uh, a bit later on, but it, um, this is one of the areas we really thought would drop off um, in a COVID world, but we've been able to uh, build and sustain that as well, which has been really interesting. Um, we've been looking at opportunities for, for networking by connecting ourselves up to other things that are similar outside the, outside the university. Um, so we recently um, uh, connected up with the Data Science Melbourne meetup group and had someone from there speak in one of our slots. Uh, and that was a really great way of introducing some of our people to stuff that was going on outside and also bringing people from outside in to, um, to hear about what we were doing. So that was uh, really good. Um, and now we're all, you know, like most people participating in hackathons as well. So, um, you know, these are, as I say, run partly by a combination of, uh, of our own ongoing staff who do some administration, uh, volunteers who set the agendas for a lot of the workshops and, and create a lot of the content uh, and then our support uh, people who we call associate instructors. So this is just a quick slide showing, you know, the sort of tools that we are currently doing. So we, as I say, we have about 18 different topics. We do about two sessions a week. Um, uh, some things like R and Python, we do every two weeks. Other ones we do um, a little bit uh, less frequently. Um, seen a lot of interest this year in Power BI and Red Cap, um, which um, uh, sort of seems to be picking up a little bit of uh, momentum in terms of things that people are using. Um, also seeing, um, and there's a mention of this at the, one of the earlier sessions, a uh, lot more interest in, interest in AI and machine learning and uh, natural language processing and deep learning and that sort of stuff as well. So. Uh, that's been um, interesting. Uh, in terms of Envivo, we're not actually doing any workshops on that at the moment, but we are trying to offer that as a drop-in and as a support topic. Um, so that's uh, a bit of a change. Uh, the, the university has some commercial providers for Envivo training. So rather than trying to duplicate that or compete with that, 
uh, we try to just help support people who are using it rather than trying to do the sessions ourselves. Um, there was also a talk earlier today about some of the challenges in trying to help people decide what to take a workshop in and the assumptions that people have about um, uh, you know, what is the tool that you're supposed to be using and why you should use it and so on. So we have what we call a toolkit, which is a website that helps to identify why you should use a particular tool and for what purpose and what's better than others for particular solutions. Um, the drop-ins are also uh, quite helpful in terms of helping people to decide what they want or to have that follow-up conversation uh, about what they, you, you, um, how you can do things better. Uh, and we make all of our um, learning resources open access using GitHub uh, so that they're out there and available uh, so people who want to review them or can't make it to a session because of work or whatever else can still get access to it. So this is um, some of our trainers, some of our instructor trainers. Um, uh, as mentioned before, some of them are professional staff members who you know, very generously give some of their time to uh, run some of the sessions and to to help, you know, again, there's been some really interesting comments about, you know, trying to keep this stuff up to date, find out where the new trends are, what needs to be done. And so those staff are invaluable uh, in terms of keeping us in touch with making sure the sessions are accurate, current, modern, moving on the way they should be. Um, some of them are from the library, some are from our bioinformatics platform, some of them are from our data science and AI platform. Um, and some of them are for other bits of the university like uh, financial health and econometrics. Um, we also have what we call associate instructors who are casual staff. Um, they're mostly uh, graduate research students. A few of them are taking a master of data science course at Monash. Uh, we had a bit of an open call uh, for people who were interested in participating in this um, about a year ago, I guess, maybe longer than that. Um, uh, and we then went through a an induction process with those students in terms of training them in the carpentry's uh, method of teaching, uh, getting them involved in, in uh, you know, starting them off as helpers in that model and then um, moving some of them, becoming instructors. And that way we were able to take some of the pressure of our volunteers because the instructors were coming from the paid cohort, the, um, the, the volunteers could concentrate on their day jobs or help us with new material and so on. So we've got people from a really interesting range of backgrounds, engineering, bioinformatics, science, astrophysics, econometrics, business statistics, commerce. Um, uh, like most people, we started off in the carpentry's model with a very hands-on face-to-face way of doing things. And, you know, if you'd asked me a year ago, would we be moving online? I would have said, no, no, it'll never work. This is a good model little bit, you know, it doesn't scale terribly well because there's only so many people you can fit in a room, but, you know, it, it um, you know, it's very practical, it's hands-on, people walk away. Having learnt a lot and also having networked with people, which is one of the things we really like about this particular model. Um, uh, but we've now had to, uh, you know, obviously change that, um, change that up quite a lot and move into an online, uh, into the online way. Um, the associate instructors sort of nominate which workshops they're interested in teaching um, or helping out in, and they put and they, they you know the, the benefit for them is that they actually get exposed to new technologies and new solutions that they might not have otherwise. Um, so we've had a few people who started off as Python is the only answer who are now actually interested in R and using R, um, and uh, and they're also thinking about how they can improve their own research because they're learning about the tools that they're using, learning what you can do with it, engaging with other researchers and doing stuff and actually expanding their repertoire. Um, and that's been a real, uh, a real bonus, um, I think, for a lot of the students who are exposed to things that they might not have otherwise have been exposed to um, because they have to learn how to use it to teach it. Um, uh, and as I said before, the professional staff are increasingly looking at that next level. And it's, I've been really interested to see quite a few people talking about how do we move past um, uh, introductory sessions and things like that and get onto that advanced stuff and that next level stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, we're starting to think about that as well. We've got a couple of intermediate type sessions, um, but we're really trying to think about, well, how can we expand that even more? Um, because uh, it is quite tricky otherwise. Um, 
and, and there's that demand for it. And go to the next slide. There we go. So this is our stats over the last uh, couple of years. These are actually, as you can see, just to the end of August. Um, so in March, we were, in February, we were all about online, face-to-face uh, -face teaching and no online. In March, we were in trouble. And in April, we were up and running with online teaching. Um, and uh, that was a fantastic effort from everyone involved to rethink the way we were doing things, rethink the pedagogy. Um, we've uh, now probably done more workshops this year than we did in all of last year. Um, we have, as you can clearly see, clearly had more people participate um, than we did last year. I was, I was hoping, my, my goal this year is that we would train 1,500 people this year, or 1,500 participants, and we're going to go well past that. We're able to offer bigger classes online. Um, we're able to deal with, uh, uh, you know, a few drop-in rooms. We don't have those space requirements that we would have done. And we've had more people turn up because they've had time on their hands, because they're stuck at home, because they don't have to drive somewhere. Um, you know, our campuses are quite spread out. And if everything's at one campus, it's a bit of a trek. Um, the drop-in numbers have actually increased uh, quite a lot as well. And the drop-ins have been quite successful. Um, again, this is something we didn't know whether it's going to work, um, but people seem actually more comfortable uh, coming to a virtual drop-in in some ways. It's a little bit less threatening than being in the room with strangers for some reason. Um, so uh, we have in fact, again, exceeded all of last year's numbers uh, already this year. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the, the engagement in that drop-in space has been really good. Um, so this is the, the traditional model that we've uh, worked with. This has been, you know, having to move into this online model has been, again, really valuable for the instructors. They've had to do a much more multifaceted online approach. And they've been doing uh, so a lot of Slack chat, a lot of creating online resources, thinking about how to do things in Zoom, juggling larger rooms, dealing with the stuff that everybody's had to deal with in terms of teaching. You know, the fact that it's less engaging if, you, if people's cameras are off and you can't tell what the, what's going on. Um, but, and the, the other advantage of being online is we've actually been able to get more of our partners in. We've been able to get our Malaysian campus students involved for the first time. Um, and that's been really uh, much appreciated by that campus as well. And now we're looking at how we can create a virtual um, uh, um, uh, community for them as well. Uh, so that when we go back to normal, whatever that might be, um, they'll be able to uh, do some face-to-face -face stuff there as well. Um, so we've also had to get people used to working in Zoom and teaching in Zoom. And so these are some of the sort of ways that we've been using to help people engage, um, as well as doing, you know, some video, you know, have more activities, breaking up the length of the sessions. You know, we used to have a lot of one-day sessions, um, which were survivable if you were doing it face to face, because you've got to have a little break, um, but we're pretty horrendous on Zoom. So we do them more over two days rather than one, which has been, um, which has really helped. Um, using the breakout rooms as a way of helping people keep up or move ahead. Um, if there's um, a little bit of a challenge there, teaching people about uh, the danger of Zoom bombings, which, you know, was a bit of an issue early on. Not that I think we ever had anyone have it, do it, but it was, you know, we were very conscious of it. Um, I, the, you know, I think Zoom has improved to the point where that's less of an issue. Um, uh, and generally, uh, you know, we found that having a community of people who are working together means that they're also sharing ideas and working together. So we've been having collaborative teaching options, chances for them to sit together, troubleshoot issues, compare notes, uh, think about, I tried this, this didn't work. I was in this session and this wasn't happening. Um, and that's been really good. Um, I know there's been a lot of discussion about no-shows and this has been a, this started off less of a problem when we moved into the COVID world that has picked up again. Um, we've mainly dealt with it by just increasing the, the, the actual number of enrollments we take um, on the assumption that a certain percentage of people won't turn up. Um, but it's still a little bit of frustrating because it's, it, there's an administrative burden on us in just having those people um, in the system and having to deal with what they're trying to do. So we asked the um, the, the students what they were what they would benefit they were getting out of this, um, and um, 
this word cloud is, you know, some of the things that, that they've mentioned. So it's been great for their own research. It's taken them out of their, a little bit out of their space. It's helped them network with people outside their own discipline. It's helped them think about teaching and what that means. Um, they've been able to share approaches with other people. Uh, they often have met, you know, people outside of Monash. So, you know, we teach with uh, a lot of some of our volunteers work in the hospitals. Uh, so it's been terrific for them to be exposed to all that stuff. Um, and, you know, they've had to think on their feet a little bit while we've invented this, this new way of, uh, or tried to do this new way of doing things. Um, and we've now been doing this long enough, so some of these people are finishing, uh, which is a shame because they're fantastic. But the good thing is we're seeing them go out and getting jobs, uh, which is not easy in the current market. And um, uh, it's been really exciting to see them, you know, progress out into um, into the into the broader world um, and thinking about their ideas of of what they could get a job in uh, a little bit more, perhaps than they did when they started with us. So that's it for me. Um, we have a whole bunch of communication methods uh, and we're uh, happy for you to follow us and contact us if you have any questions, but um, otherwise I'll stop now and see what else we have to say.